Welcome to Season 5 of the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with yours Peels and Brent Wright. We're bringing in industry experts, patients, vendors, and thought leaders to share their stories, insights, and visions for the future. Whether you're a clinician, a researcher, a vendor, or someone with a personal interest in the field, we have something for you. Join us as we delve into how advancements in personalized healthcare and 3D printing are revolutionizing the industry and changing the way we approach the design, production, and delivery of prosthetic and orthotic devices. Hello, everyone. My name is Joris Peels, and this is another episode of the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with Brent Wright. How are you doing, Brent? Hey, man. Doing doing pretty well. I, I know you said it's been hot over your way, uh, but man, it was hot in Florida. I think my son was playing baseball, and they said it was like 170 degrees on the wow. 107 degrees on the uh, turf field. <laughs> As I'm a European, That's that crazy. doesn't mean anything to me unless he was literally boiling. Um, so, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what that means, man. It's like two thirds or something. I don't know. It's a difficult thing to do. We don't understand. So you I'll, okay? I'll, yeah, yeah. I, I'll have to do the conversion <laughs> sometime. No, 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 no. It's hot, hot, hot. hot. It's hot. Okay, okay, okay. How did he do, by the way? Is he okay? He did really well. He uh, he's actually becoming. I mean, he hits always hits very well, but um, he is becoming a really really great pitcher. He's he has become kind of the the uh, one of the team's aces and. It's been really neat to see him kind of grow into that, grow into his body. And I mean, the kid just towers over me. So it's it's pretty wild. <laughs> okay, that sounds really good. That sounds really good. So this episode was brought to you by, uh, well, some 3D printing service people. Well, they do 3D printing and engineering and other things. Um, they're called some like Advanced 3D. Tell us more about them, Brent. Yeah, yours. Uh, Advanced 3D is based in Kinston, North Carolina. I'm a part of it with two other partners. As far as I know, we're the only clinicians that design, run the printer, and uh, and then finish some of these products, too. The whole idea is to come alongside clinicians wherever they are, interested in 3D printing, and help them on their journey uh, wherever they want to uh, go. So whether they want to learn software side of things, uh, actually 3D print uh, test sockets or definitive sockets, or flexible inners, uh, we're here to help them out on that journey. And we love doing that stuff. Okay, super cool, dude, super cool. All right, who's on the show today? Oh, wow. Well, I'm really excited to have uh, Brian Emling on the show today. He is a prosthetist orthotist at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And, I mean, what a better way to use additive manufacturing than with uh, kiddos, you know? It's a, it's a quick way to not only iterate, but create some things that you can't do with traditional fabrication. Uh, Brian and I have done some presenting together, and I always enjoy his perspective. He not only is doing the scanning, the modifying, but he's also running multiple printers, uh, including a MultiJet Fusion 580 printer. I'm really excited to hear his journey today on the podcast. And I know he's got something for our listeners. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, welcome to the show, Brian. So how did you get involved in orthotics and prosthetics? Yeah. First off, thanks so much for inviting me on. And as a clinician of almost 10 years now in the field, you know, you get to a point where you realize, like, I, I guess I've learned enough that I have enough to share. So really appreciate you guys having me on. But as far as the journey to get here... I started out and I think a lot like, you know, the path of a lot of the clinicians in our field is that I came, you know, I came around to ONP. I graduated from undergrad in business and business management, and I had a bend towards studio arts. And so I, I went to work for a, a company making rock climbing holds. So I was kind of like their production foreman and we were doing everything through hands-on, um, hands-on design, and even the the pouring of our rock climbing holds were measuring on a gram scale, just like we do in, in prosthetics for our thermosets, and and then pouring them into a mold and and waiting for them, waiting for the polyurethane to kick off, and then going through the whole kind of post processing. So I was I was learning a lot of the skills for O and P before I even knew that I'd be going into the field. Uh, and then I, I, uh, I guess I realized that there was kind of a dead end 
started looking into other industries and, and stumbled upon ONP. Wendy Beatty, who's I think in Chicago now, she she invited me into her office in Troy, Michigan, at uh, when she was uh, with Becker, and I think I spent like like a minute in the in the office and and went into the back lab and and like in that moment I realized like all right this is it <laughs> I think I I went to the community college website that night like signed up for all the prerequisites to to get into a master's level program and. And started on that journey. What, yeah. did you see, what, what did you see in that room that you really liked that much? Though? Was it like just a craft of it or just a culmination of all the things you liked? Or I I just like the familiarity of the tools that I was seeing and like all of these tools that I worked with at home, but I also worked with in like the ceramic studio. They were all things that like that. I knew how to use, but didn't realize that like that there was an occupation that had them all in use on a day to day basis. Right, like it. O and P is this amazing field that that combines art and science, and and no like high school counselor like tells you about it, and it's it's such a gem of a field for the, those folks that have those skills of both arts and sciences. It's an amazing field. And I'm, so, I'm just shocked that, that there's so many kids out there that that would be amazing clinicians if they just knew about it earlier on. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. It, it, it is. It's kind of, I don't know. I'm always surprised how everyone gets into this thing differently. Everyone has a completely different background. And everybody's also, it seems quite more I don't know, more happy with our choice than if than than just you know your average people doing average business or, or industrial type stuff. Yeah, you're kind of asking like you know what was it and in in that moment where I walked into the back lab, it was the tools that for me. I knew nothing about the field. I think I had walked into the office, met a few people, and then we went to the back lab. And it was at that moment that I was like, that, like all of this is familiar, but in different settings. The, a gram scale, some of the alignment jigs, like I, I have an understanding of how those would be used. And then all the other like hand tools uh, and like sculptural tools. So like just in that single moment of looking at all of this stuff and, and going, wow, there's a job that does all of this or use, uses all of these items on a, like on a single day. But then it was, you know, the next like few hours where we were going, seeing a patient and then using those tools, that's where that's where that that like that motivation to go home and sign up for classes. Like that's I think that's where I really got that excitement from. But yeah, it was I think maybe not exact to a lot of, of how other people get into the field, but probably have just a very similar experience and response. It's like once they see it, I gosh, why why did it take me so long? <laughs> Or why didn't someone need to point me in this direction years ago? So, can can you take us through just a little bit of uh, of how you, you know, it sounded like you got some experience then beforehand going to um, school. You were getting your classes. We have a lot of listeners that just wonder, hey, how do I get into the field? What is um, what is needed? I know some has changed a little bit, but just kind of your your journey as far as okay, so you were getting the experience. You got your classes knocked out. Where'd you go to school? How'd you do your residency? And then, then how'd you end up at Children's? Sure, I, I, everybody's journey is kind of a little bit different coming into it. Um, I think, I think the people that are able to get into kind of a shadowing or even like a, a tech or a front office and getting some exposure to our field before they get in is really, really helpful. Because you, like in our field, we're, we're asked to wear so many hats on a day to day basis, you know? and I think some of the other, some of the other allied health um, professions, they're they're not asked to do so many specific things in a day. So one is I would encourage anyone to to just try to get some exposure in, and really, and it could be like. It could be front office because then you learn some coding. You learn about like components or how patients call in and talk about, oh, I put my prosthesis on and it doesn't click. And what does that mean? And as a prosthetist, you immediately kind of go through a tick list of, of should it click or shouldn't it click and, and what should be clicking? Because somebody literally emailed me that 
this morning and I had to figure, troubleshoot what it was and get them in this afternoon. So I think it would be invaluable for any of the listeners out there to, to understand that like the importance of getting some exposure ahead of time. I, I really didn't except for some of those like office visits and in it, I think it took me a while to get my kind of wheels under me compared to some of my, my peers. For me, uh, coming back around to the field, I had to go back and I did my undergraduates. So then I had to go back and do a bunch of prerequisites. But thankfully, our our program or the way that the master's level program is set up, in, in at least in the U.S., is that it's an entry-level master's program. So as long as you hit the prerequisites of, of the school, whatever school you're applying for, and there's a like they're kind of broad enough that you know that you can apply to a few different schools as long as you hit their their prerequisites. So I I applied as like an as an entry level graduate after completing a lot of the the prerequisites at a community college in the area. I went to Eastern Michigan and I did a two year two year program there. And then ended up going to residency at Oklahoma University uh, Health Sciences Center in Oklahoma City. Uh, and for me, it was a, they were a level one trauma center and they had a PED side and they also had an adult side. So I got pretty good exposure to seeing both age groups, not necessarily completely reflective of like what the average clinician sees. But for me, I, I think it was really important to, to see you know, both age groups and, and kind of what, what is being done on a day-to-day basis for, for those age groups and those various pathologies. Uh, and then after residency, two-year residency, one discipline orthotics, one discipline prosthetics, then I went to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and I've been here ever since. So I started here in 2015 and just keep cranking along. Okay, that's really and one thing I think the the community college route. I mean, I think it's not as prestigious and not as cool, but it saves you a ton of money, right? Is that is that would you other would you say to people, look, just do the community college thing? That's a much better route to getting there, or much more effective, or what do you think? Oh, I think that's kind of a broad perspective. Is like, say you knew you were getting into O and P, doing your undergraduate coursework at a community college, like hitting your human anatomy or like A and P and then your chemistry and your, your basic math level. Those are those for your undergraduate. If if you knew you were getting into O and P, like that would be, that would be, save you a ton of money because graduate school is not cheap. So, and then I think for anyone that's like worried about being missing the college experience, I think in O and P you're, you're in a classroom with, 10 to 25 people and you're in with them for two years. And I think some of the, or the relationships that I have now from my graduate school program are, are just as valuable uh, as, and and important to me as the relationships I established in undergrad. So, uh, I mean, if I could do it again, I certainly would have like knowing that I was going into ONP, I would have done the community college classes First wrapped up my undergraduate and then gone straight into to master's program and and maybe I wouldn't be facing some of the student loans that I that I currently have. So I would encourage people to to think that far ahead and definitely approach the the field through community college if if they can do that. Exactly. So where did you go? What happened? And what did you do after that? Okay, so after community college, then I went to Eastern Michigan University. And then did the two-year program, graduate program there. I'd say that was really focused on getting me into a residency. They were really trying to prepare students to do the next step, and not like not a lot of stress on on the use of of technology there as a means of performing our daily skills. And that's right. I, I did an article for the Academy today, I guess two summers ago, maybe, or summer ago. And it was, we kind of reached out to a few different professors and had them talk about how they're using technology in education. And it was really like, I think it was, it, it was really interesting to hear them and how they're approaching the use of CAD CAM. Instead of 10 years ago or 12 years ago when I was in school, they were talking about, you know, there is CAD CAM, but 
it's CAD CAM to, it's a different technique for you to use uh, for treating a patient. And now the, the professors are using CAD CAM in school as a means of teaching their students like more effectively, like introducing digital models or, or using virtual reality for students to understand, like if I tighten one screw in a prosthesis, where does the socket go or where does the foot go? They're not using, or they, they've found ways to use CAD CAM, not as necessarily a means of treating a specific patient like a certain way. They're using it to, to educate their, or their, their students and, and help them understand these fundamentals better. But then they're also using it to, like, for the students to design components and then, and then, like, you know, put them together and see how they go together and how they interact with each other, which is like, like that's building on so many of the skills that they had already learned in undergraduate or like in coursework, they may have been exposed to solid works in an engineering class. So they're just building on those skills that are already there to help the, help the students understand the skills and, and the clinical know-how for our day to day. And I, I think it's a, it's a, an amazing transition because I was I was shown, oh, you use you can use CAD CAM, but traditionally we have used hand casting because we get so much better control. And then after that, you could go to it. So I, I just uh, am really appreciative and, and 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 respect the professors that have found a way to incorporate CAD CAM as a means of teaching rather than just looking at it as like a clinical approach. Okay, and when did you first like actually come into contact with well with the 3D printing stuff? Um, probably when I got a Creality CR10 outside of the <laughs> outside of like graduate school. I I yeah, I made it all the way through residency and still like didn't didn't touch a scanner, didn't wasn't using 3D printing in in ONP. Was certainly aware of both technologies, but the 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 window to use it in ONP really wasn't there until after after I got out of school. And then even then, I guess my the use of of scanning definitely presented itself pretty quickly in practice and that I have the the opportunity to work with Lee Davis here at Children's and she's just a just I mean a, a spinal guru and and what she was using a white light scanner and then you know doing all of her own modifications spinal modifications and i was covering an office that that was i you know it, it was really it was kind of underserved in that it, it it needed there were a lot of patients that needed spinal and some of them weren't weren't willing to make the trek to a northern office so i went and saw a lot of those patients south of of atlanta and started doing a lot of CAD down there for the spinal. So my first introduction into it really into the field in like clinical practice was through spinal. And then kind of, I guess I grew out of the use of spinal into some of the areas I am now. Okay. okay. And, and what pre, what are the 3d printing stuff? What's 3d printing stuff do you use day to day? Let's say, because you started with this creality stuff, but what are the actual tools you use nowadays? Right. So from a, a, like shape acquisition side, we're pretty lucky to have a few options available to us. So we have a, a star scanner that we use for all of our, or well, star scanner that we use primarily for most of our, our cranial. We have a, a handful of structure scanners on the iPads. And then we have a handheld optical or structured light scanner. And then we also have a Ortho America's smart sock that we use for a lot of our inpatient cranial patients. Um, that's, a, that's actually nice because you guys have a, the, the option because you, you, okay, is the volume, because we've talked to most people, we talk to our practitioners and say, are, is in a hospital type like environment, is the, do you guys get more weirdness, more different cases or something like that? Or are you just can able, able to afford more because there's more volume? What's the difference <laughs> here between, between a practitioner and outside? Yeah, I think our, like our, our hospital, Leaders definitely emphasize like having the right tools to have the chance at being excellent. I just I kind of cliche as that sounds. I I really respect the children's system and the leaders here, and that they are they are wanting to to provide 
the clinicians, the physicians, the therapists with, with the tools that they have the best chance of providing excellent care. And so the, you know, the, the smart sock, what grew out of at the time, we, we didn't really have a great way of, of seeing some of these really complex kids that are in the TICU um, and, and had pretty significant cranial asymmetries. And so it was, it was like, well, what's available to us, an optical light scanner in on a six month old that's been in TICU all their life with a, a flashing light. There was some concern about how that would be as a stimulus. And so with OrthoAmerica having a system that, that was approved, I, they, the smart sock was a, a really good option to do that. So, you know, I think that's how we ended up there. The structure scanners, we, we had an optical light scanner, a structured optical light scanner. And I just, sorry, I just keep saying structured optical light. I want your listeners to know that I'm not talking about structure scanner. Hey, you don't have the iPad? No, no. <laughs> yeah, we do have this, the structure iPad scanners. And that's where it's uh, at the time, like we had a, a structured light handheld scanner and it was just really challenging for a lot of clinicians to use. And then structure iPad based scanner came out and you could put that in the hands of most people. It was like, it was like the point and shoot camera of the eighties. And, and so you could just, you could give it to most anyone and they would, they were like, all right, this is approachable now. And we've been using, using that system like for our department for a number of years now. And that's mainly spine and lower extremity, some upper extremity and, and clinicians use it day to day and really don't have issues with, with the scanning process. I think there's some other like little quirks that come, come along and they might be specific to us in our hospital system. Um, but it's a, I think it's a really powerful system for people that are, are like approaching scanning for the first time, or maybe they have to use scanning for patients because they're in an office and and they're just they're really uncomfortable with using technology it's a it's a really approachable system and then our use of the structured light scanners and just a, an, an attempt to be a little bit more i guess accurate and precise with our scanning in hopes of of definitely trying to use some of it for some cranial, whether that's inpatient or outpatient, but maybe at some, some offices that that we don't have a a large OrthoAmerica star scanner at. So that just the the newer handheld optical light scanners are are much easier to use than you know what we were using ten years ago, and I think it it really opens up access for for patients to get the care mm-hmm. that that maybe they, they wouldn't get because they'd have to go to another office in order to get, um, you know, to, to undergo that digital shape acquisition. Yeah. So and the interesting thing is like, so scanning is a lot, is really difficult actually for a lot of people. We know this and there's, there's basically two ways of doing it. Like, well, there's three ways actually. Like there's like a comb way, like, Hey, don't invest in anything, get a comb app or something very similar. Get your existing hardware. The phone you used to call your mom is also your scanner. There's an intermediate way of trying to find a scanner. I think Brent found that actually he's actually really happy with his Einscan. That's a uh, that's a really cheap thing, you know. Uh, and they used to be terrible, and then uh, now people are really positive about them. And there's another way of investing like a bunch more money, but but you can invest oodles amounts of money in in, in, in scanners and not get anywhere. Do you have any kind of advice in saying like, okay, you know, don't invest in the beginning, see if it's for you, or do you have any advice in getting started with scanning? Because it could be very bewildering, I think, just selecting yeah. a technology, selecting a vendor, everything. Yeah, I guess it would depend on, like, what you were wanting to use it for. But I would say, if you were wanting to use it for something very specific, and you had, like, no prior experience I would really try to get my hands on a a lower cost option before making a major investment. And the lower cost option being anywhere from here, I get comb to the structure based systems, and and just like getting familiar with it because that tool that or that the use of that can be used for other things. And so if you have like a very specific thing in mind that you wanted to do learning the technology and like 
comfort with a scanner and like maybe, okay, now I have to take this STL file and import it into this program to clean it up and then go from that program into my, my CAD modification program just to like understand the steps. I, I think like that would be really invaluable for, for, for somebody that is, is just kind of getting familiar with the, the use, just the hand skills of scanning and, and, you know, how to juggle it all, you know, what position to put the patient in and then, and then, you know, what your workflow, like digital workflow is to get that, what you just captured and, and take it into your, your modification software to start out with something like, like comb or, or structure understand the process and then move towards a handheld scanner. Because if you got like a structured light, optical light scanner, and it was your first time using it, I I think you're more likely to run into issues that kind of ca- like callous you a little bit towards the technology. And if you had tried taking a step back and tried something a little bit more approachable, you'd learn the ins and outs and and figure out ways to make you a little bit more successful down the line. So, and that's, I think that comes from just seeing so many clinicians here in our department trying to incorporate it into their practice that they're like, somebody makes an investment and says, here, here's this amazing scanner. But then they try it a handful of times and like, maybe they tried it with a kid for cranial and the kid was screaming and the mom was getting upset. And then the clinician's sweating, <laughs> they get back sweat because they're like freaking out that everyone's crying. That's where I think if they had just tried like scanning with a comb scanner, an iPad based scanner on some models at a fraction of the cost, learned to use that and then went to these other ones, they would, mom and baby wouldn't be screaming. Clinician might be sweating a little bit still because it's something new, but the, it would all be internal crying, nothing external. <laughs> you have to take into specific considerations of scanning for kids yeah, uh, because uh, they historically don't sit well and all that <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah. What kind of things do you guys do? Do you do some hybrid stuff as far as you know, casting, scanning, that sort of thing? Or, or what are what are some of the tricks that you can share uh, to our listeners? I look at my, my job uh, as a clinician. My job is to make a device that meets the functional needs of, of the patient. Some people would say, no, you're your job is is to make these devices and they have to be functional for a patient, but it's also about your bottom line and you have to make cost effective decisions. I I really try to focus on that that I am designing a device to meet or exceed the, the function of the patient, especially with, with kids, is that we hope that they are developing and progressing. And so the device that I'm making needs to meet what they're doing now, but it also needs to meet or ex- exceed what they're doing now, what they're doing a month from now, you know, a year from now. They're usually outgrown a year, but you, you get my point. Is like I have to design function for the future. As far as like you know that design side, my approach is not the most cost effective. Sometimes I will do a traditional cast and get you know get the shape the controls that I want, and then I'll scan, I will pour up and I'll scan the plaster cast itself and then enter into the digital workflow. And I know that's, it's not efficient with time. It's not efficient with materials, but I, I think if I were to try to do a shape capture of, of scanning from the beginning, I I might, I think I'd miss the mark quite a bit on some of these patients because their anatomy is so unique, like congenital kids have congenital anatomy. They do not have the anatomy that we look at in in textbooks. Some of the anatomy is there, some of it's different orientations, different feels. And so for me, I, I really go down the kind of the workflow of making the best device in the end and not really like a kind of a, I guess like the most cost effective approach, which that's really tough for a lot of people to convince their employers that that's better. I understand that. And I guess I'm, I'm just really blessed to, to work at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta where that is stressed. And I think some of the leaders really believe in that. But that sounds like a really mega exciting part of geometry that, 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 that just the variations in shapes and conditions is so, so huge compared to, 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 to other people. And are there particular things you, you really kind of encounter that with that varied geometry, with these varied problems that you're like, 
wow, the, the puzzle even becomes even more uh, complicated? Um, yeah, I think like on a, a lot of our kids that have various syndromes, we get to see a lot of the imaging um, that you know that orthopedics is seeing or that like neurosurgery has taken. We could see like a full skeletal survey of an infant and have a, an idea of how like what anatomy is there. So with some of the like syndromic kids that have these these various syndromes is is they the there there might be there there might be a, a complete like longitudinal absence of of a radius. We're just trying to then stabilize or we are trying to stabilize a hand in, in all planes. They could be so small that you really can't even like but you have such a hard time palpating that anatomy and and we can pull that up and, and see some of that in the imaging and we're not just relying on on physical palpation to to determine what's there. We get to see a lot of the CTs and MRs and look at mental structures or meniscus and and see what kind of stability is there. So we're pretty fortunate in in being able to see a little bit more than what maybe some other clinicians are presented with. And is the small size, is that also an issue with I don't know, the type of devices, that, you know, for example, I can think of wall thickness or the type of printing you can do. The all of a sudden could normally make a device for an adult and then all of a sudden the kid, you have to you have a major engineering challenge because it, it just doesn't fit or doesn't work. Yeah, I, I think, and and this is like probably consistent with the rest of the field is that we, we just always over engineer. Like we, we just, like, with kids, it's like, Three thirty seconds and and above, and hopefully it works. And then they reach maybe fifty pounds. You're jumping up, or de- depending on how much tone they have, or you're increasing it. Sorry, I don't know what three thirty seconds is in metric. <laughs> what like two millimeters, maybe? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I need a like a converter, a handheld converter right here. I think we we just tend to always over engineer, but that's the that's probably the beauty of what what Brent is really doing is is that he's looking at it and saying like no these things don't need to be uniform three thirty seconds there's these regions that can be be thinner and or some of the areas that can be more robust to to create the most function for these devices for these kids or these adults so I think we, you know we just tend to over engineer until we can get a little bit better at understanding some of the CAD simulations to to truly engineer each design, each device for each patient and what their functional level is. All right, we're going to pause right there. We had a suggestion from a listener to do a section that is called something like Hot Takes with Yoris. Uh, Yoris has a great perspective on 3D printing and specifically 3D printing for business, I thought it was a good idea. So let's hop right into it. Now, we're going to do another little segment brought to us by Guestpodo, and that's G-S-P-O-D-O, uh, which is an automation suite to help you uh, automate parts of your workflow, your 3D printing, uh, or your CAD to 3D printing, or your um, your 3D scan to uh, 3D printing uh, to final part workflow. And uh, we're going to do something that's called the uh, the hot take, right, uh, Brent? What's up? Yeah, yeah. So looking forward to the uh, hot take. And, you know, this time we're just going to talk about, okay, so just Poto does do automations, and it's really good at doing foot orthoses. The AFO software is coming down the line. But it's uh, how do we uh, do something to combine all that together, make it make it nice, clean, efficient workflow? Yeah, exactly. So, so I think what we're seeing is is we, we okay. The universal glue of the three D printing workflow. I think we all of our listeners know already is Mesh Mixer, right? Uh, which is a free little like kind of like an orphan software product, <laughs> hopefully living very quietly within the 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 uh, catacombs at uh, at Autodesk, and hopefully nobody will will, will take it away because we'll all be like <laughs> screwed <laughs> without Mesh Mixer. So that's one integral part. Like we're seeing stuff like Guestpod and stuff is going to add to your f- workflow. But we're seeing like, for example, we're going to mention this episode as well. You've got different 3D scanners. Each have their own software, you know? Then you've got CAD. Uh, you may have people sending you stuff. You may have people, uh, you know, your own CAD. You may have different CAD packages. You may have other uh, kind of other software packages as well. So so we're, 
yeah, we're kind of what we're thinking and where we're brainstorming is if if we like look at this, we need some kind of universal file management tool uh, to, to 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 capture these files, to keep them, and to and to annotate them, and to kind of work with them throughout the lifetime of the file. So everybody's always saying, "Oh, you don't have to keep the cast." Yeah, okay, but you have to keep the file. Where are you going to do this? On your hard drive? On there? You know? So we need this file management tool. That's something that I see that that it kind of exists, right? Do you have something like that in your? But you bought, did you bodge it together yourself, Brent, or, or how did that work? I mean, that's a tough one because a lot of people want it to sit in their electronic medical records, mm-hmm. right? So the electronic medical record with the patient, and there's mm-hmm. a few different ways to do that. Mm-hmm. But then sometimes that can be a little bit tricky. Not only can these files be a little bit larger, uh, mm-hmm. then if you're looking for a specific file and you're like, oh, where where is it? You've got a get the patient name, figure out the date, all that. And and that's great, but it's so much more than just the file and where is it. It's how was it made? How What are the measurements off of it? Exactly, yeah. All that stuff being together in one spot to maybe serve it up to an electronic medical record system, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think is, is very interesting. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't talked about this before, but like, for example, if I have different slicer settings, right? Uh, the part will come out different, right? If we're looking at FDM, it's easiest to understand material extrusion. You know, if I upgrade my software of the of the printer, firmware in the printer, or if I upgrade the 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 software of my slicing software, which could be made by the printer manufacturer or somebody else entirely, I can end up having a different part with different properties. And if we're looking at this from a kind of like, you know, if it's a test thing, yo, yeah, oh, cute, everything. But if we're looking at this as something that has some liability on it, that could be an issue. So, you know, I think it would be really important to to log somewhere what the file type it was, what 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 software it was sliced in, all of this information, just have that very accessible, just in case those things change, right? But sometimes you can get into the weeds, and man, there may be some sort of technicality, and it's maybe a requirement that's not even yeah. needed, but then you get hosed on the back end because you are trying to do the right thing. So. That's all I'm saying about that. It's not that we're trying to skirt the issue or anything, but how much information yeah. is too much information? Uh, that's a good point. That's a really good point. I think so. So this kind of like this, 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 this some kind of digital file repository thing, really, really good, especially I think in a complicated office. You know, if you're talking about like, well, we had some people like these hangar people, like there's hundreds of offices, but also like East Point and other companies we, we, we had on the episode that have four or five offices or a central fab, you know, for that, you know, a kind of a solution for them to let them safely, securely exchange those files or print jobs or, or annotate them and give feedback. That I think would be a uh, super valuable kind of a software tool as well. Uh, I think, I think something like that, that, that's something that I don't see, or at least do you see something like that on the market? Those kind of things are not really. Well, you don't see it all together as one. What can, what can bring, you know, the scan, the file, the printed file, all together as one. You see s- stuff like the the quoting tools and that mm-hmm. sort of thing, and they might have a, like a repository of every single file that you've sent in. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, nothing nothing all together, and that would be very interesting. Okay, cool. All right, good. I'm glad we uh, had this discussion. That was the hot take by Brent and yours. Now we go on with the rest of the episode. And one which is a super practical question I want to ask you because you come into contact with so many children. We already kind of skipped past the, the, the scanning subject but scanning kids absolute nightmare right so so any pro tips what, what, what's can you sedate them no what because what, what, it is really difficult especially small children babies that kind of thing yeah uh and then also older children just like you know sitting still i, I remember it, like i would have been a nightmare as a kid so, so yeah like, any kind of pro tips tips there like uh on doing that yeah i mean one is is just like a basic test of like red light, green light, or can you stay frozen for this amount of time and just see, can the kid, uh, can the child, the lovely, agreeable child that you're working with, can they follow the instruction and can you make kind of a little game out of it? If they can pass that test, which I wouldn't have been able to as a kid, but if they can pass that test, if they're more like my sister, then I would move on to, all right, like now I'm going to, I'm going to take this, like this, this really cool digital picture of you. And afterwards, if you're really still, you can stand still or you can hold still for this amount of time, then I can show you a picture. I can show you your arm. And, and then if you're like really still, 
then maybe I could, I could even print like your arm or hand for you. And so uh, like on some of the kids that I've, that I, it would have been really great to, to get a scan. What I've done is uh, I said like, all right, I need to get one kid. It was SMOs. And I, and so I, I had really had a, well, what we would term a Z foot, whereas hind foot was going into valgus and his forefoot was going into uh, adduction, kind of supination adduction. And, and he was like, he was six, five, and he could follow instruction and I could get his foot positioned with his mom holding his toes. And so I said, all right, if, if you can hold this position and work with me, then what I'll do is I'll take a, a scan of your entire of your entire body, and I'll make you a little you know, a little figurine. And then I, I ended up taking like his his full body scan, making him three inches tall. And then I took like a uh, like a I don't know like an F fourteen jet, and then like mesh mixer. I like put them onto each other, so like it looks like he's like this kind of like jet rocket man attached to this F-14. So when I gave him the SMOs, I also gave him this little like little action figure of himself. And I'm pretty sure like that kid will sit still all the time now if I ask him to. So I think like using some games, using some creativity to to get these kids to follow, follow in line is really beneficial. But doing that first like little test of, all right, can you hold this position for 10 seconds? If they can't, then like I just I just get away from scanning and then go to a hand casting and then doing scanning afterwards because I definitely want to try to build on my interactions with the kids so that the next time I see them maybe I have that chance for success and and just doing digital shape capture immediately. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. And then and then so after you you, you put it in the scan, do you have one app you like to clean up your scans? Or does it really depend on the workflow? Does it really depend on on on, on what you're doing? Yeah, it just works just depending on what scanner we're using, we'll follow that workflow. But then after that, we'll go into a variety of programs. Spinal, I'm mainly working in in Vorum's CanFit. That's what our department uses and has used for years for modification. For a lot of the other devices, I could be going, like I might use CanFit to like, to get the shape, put on some like trim lines and then take it into another program that could be like Fusion 360 or it could be Mesh Mixer, Blender, which I've just started working with Blender. These are just ways that like I have found successful. I think I have a lot to learn and I am always have my ear open for tips from Brent on, on processes he uses. And I'd say I'm always striving to to try to bring myself up to speed to his level or, or other people in the field that are working in the digital space at that level. I think I'm working from what I have available to me and then finding the ways to work through that, the workflow so that I end up with the device I want in the end. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. And then, and then when you're printing, what do you print on right now? You, you have the MGF, what else? Yeah, so we have, we also have a raise 3d i think the pro 2 plus which we originally had gotten i was doing a lot of and still am i was doing a lot of like preoperative planning models and doing like really large models say like full length femurs and so we needed the i needed the the, the build space for those i i could have been i did a full length from pelvis to foot and it was that the physician wanted to see the kind of the torsional deformity and what osteotomies they would want to perform to to address. I've done some like forearms, and you know, those are ten to twelve inches, or like large pelvis that just fit in that. So we have the the Pro Two Plus. And then we also have the Form Two, which we just got our hands on, and really I, I kind of have that position for our lab to use in, in designing like small components, like if they wanted to do like little injection molding, or if they wanted to do print like components that they like for dummies. And then also the possibility of like, I've used it a little bit for injection, silicone injection molding for really small upper extremity patients. I like that you can print with clear resin and, and see when you do a, like a little injection that you don't have any air bubbles or that you, all your voids are filled. So that's that's not really in use, but we have it, and I, I just need to get 
and get the time to get it set up and and our team on board. And then the multi-jet fusion, the HP 580 here at our main office. Okay. okay. And, 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 you know, why, when would you get into 3D printing? When would you say, like, as a, as a person in a similar role, do you have to do this? Or is it kind of like, ah, oh, you kind of, it's you should be curious of this, it's fun, or? Yeah, I, I think the safer, better option for the patient is maybe in conjunction with what you're already doing. I think this saying is is fine for, like, our entire field is, is like, as clinicians, we can make most anything. We can make something physical for almost any patient. But should we? And in in three D printing is like we can make most devices, but do we really understand like one the material or two the variances in strength or regions in strength, the susceptibility to environmental conditions, salt water, sweat, a weeping wound? Like there, there's a lot of those things that I would really caution a new person about just saying like, oh, I could design and build this and, and 3D print it. And, and like, it'll be, it'll be, you know, better for the patient because it's, it's a new technology and it's lighter. There's a, that's a really loaded statement. Brent and I have talked a lot about is that like now with digital design, we have the ability to really understand a lot of these factors, but we should understand them before we go just saying, oh, I can build this and put it on a patient. I will oftentimes, and this goes back to like making the most functional device for my patient, maybe not the most cost-effective approach, is that like I will do a traditional and then I will also do a a 3D printed one and and like allow them to either just see how how it goes here in practice or like in 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 the clinical room and not let them go home on, on it or with it. And then as I kind of further hone my abilities through design is then starting to replace the traditional from this like hybrid or in conjunction approach to, all right, now they're functioning or now they're using this functional device. Okay. Okay. That sounds like a really uh, great uh, kind of way to approach it. Hey, Brian, thank you so much for for, for telling us about your experiences. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the chance to get on. You're great. Hey, thank you so much for being here today, Brian. Yes, sir. Have a great day. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, thanks, Brian, for uh, sharing kind of your experience and just a little bit of a peek under the hood of what you've got rolling. And, uh, you know, I, I love talking shop. And this episode will give a lot to our listeners to kind of think about, especially in the, round of, in the realm of scanning. So I think that's really neat. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. And, uh, This is another great podcast episode, and we hope you really, really enjoyed it, and thank you very much for your time.